Dr. Joe, who's always been reserved and aloof, has finally moved into my house. But her first move was to completely expose herself before my eyes. Seeing this, I got a mischievous idea. It was a perfect chance to get back at Fa Yu Ching, the white lotus from my past life. Back then, I followed her like a devoted follower for 18 years, but I never even became a backup option for her. After the apocalypse, I was just food to her. So, I quickly sent a cozy photo of Dr. Joe and me to Fa Yu Ching, along with a message saying, Sorry, Fa Yu Ching, but I've found true love now. Let's stop contacting each other. When Fa Yu Ching heard the message, she broke free from her trance to pick up her phone. After seeing the photo, she exploded, accusing me of being fooled by Dr. Joe. But I just laughed. Wasn't she the same? Besides, Dr. Joe is way better than her in every way. How could I give her up for Fa Yu Ching? Fa Yu Ching burst into tears, refusing to believe that I had changed so suddenly. She thought it must be Dr. Joe's influence. Meanwhile, her friends mocked her for being self centered and that karma has come to bite her. If you've missed any previous chapters, the link is in the description below. Be sure to catch up. Alright, folks, let's set our sights high today. Our goal is 500 likes. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. On the other hand, I asked Dr. Joe if she thought I was being too harsh. She leaned in and said she trusted my reasons. Hearing that, I couldn't help but lower my guard. After all, who could resist such an understanding and sensible woman? Before long, Dr. Joe had prepared a table full of delicious lunch. I had just taken a bite of an apple when a message popped up in the homeowners group chat. It was from the same troublemaker who used to be so arrogant. She was back at it again, boasting about her connections in the government and threatening everyone to hand over their food or face consequences after the snowstorm. It caught me off guard. I remembered Annie Lin, who was the first victim looted by Xinjiang Hao. The fact that she was still alive was quite a surprise. Dr. Zhou mentioned quietly that she had left some supplies when treating Lin Xiaohu, assuming the snowstorm would pass quickly. Little did she know it would last for two and a half months. I found it puzzling. Even with the supplies Dr. Zhou left, Annie Lin couldn't have survived for so long, especially with a two and a half year old grandson. Then, someone mentioned that Lin Xiaohu had died about 10 days ago due to lack of medication. Suddenly, it all made sense. It seemed that Annie Lin had resorted to desperate measures. Dr. Zhou, having been under Xinjiang Hao house control for two days, was no stranger to such grim realities, including the possibility of cannibalism. Just as I was going about my day, my phone suddenly rang. Seeing that it was Uncle Yu calling, I picked up the phone and asked what was going on. Uncle Yu seemed a bit awkward, which caught my attention. He's one of the few good people left after the apocalypse, and also a martial artist, so I naturally wouldn't refuse his call. Uncle Yu hesitantly mentioned that Xiao Li Mei's daughter, Tang Bao, was running a fever and needed some fever-reducing medicine. Uncle Yu, who has been single all his life, was probably tempted by the young and attractive Xiao Li Mei after being single for 40 years. How could he resist such temptation? So, he became the willing victim of this scheming mother. Hearing this, my expression faltered. This situation wasn't simple. Among all the homeowners, only Uncle Yu had managed to make the most correct choice among many. But I didn't dwell on it too much. After all, it's someone else's family matter, and this could be an opportunity to win over Uncle Yu for future use. So, I smiled and said that I still have a few boxes of fever-reducing medicine and asked Uncle Yu to come pick it up later. Upon hearing this, Uncle Yu was overjoyed and profusely thanked me, even swearing that if I ever need his help in the future, he will do his best to assist me. At that moment, Dr. Joe leaned over and asked if I had a good relationship with Uncle Yu. I answered indifferently, stating that people interact mainly for mutual benefit. Uncle Yu is a kind and honest person, and having him owe me a favor might be useful later on. Moreover, I don't want to see a retired soldier like him lose the last glimmer of his humanity in these apocalyptic times. Soon, there was a knock on my door from Uncle Yu and little Zhang Yi. Hey, it's Uncle Yu, I thought as I glanced at the door's monitor. Unexpectedly, Xiao Li Mei was also there, looking anxious. Our Tang Bao has a high fever, Zhang Yi, please help us, she pleaded urgently. Without hesitation, I tossed a box of fever-reducing medicine through the small door window. Give it to the child quickly. Don't waste any time, I instructed. Uncle Yu gratefully picked up the medicine, expressing his thanks. Zhang Yi, thank you so much. You've helped me out twice already in this apocalypse, he said sincerely. Just then, Xiao Li Mei stepped forward, her voice filled with desperation. Zhang Yi, do you have a heater? Could Tang Bao stay at your place for a while? We'll leave once she gets better. However, I saw through her request immediately. You're probably wanting to take a mile when given an inch, I thought to myself. Calmly, 
I address the group outside. Sorry, miss, but these are special times. I can't easily let outsiders in. Plus, we're almost out of coal. We're even resorting to wearing eight down jackets each to keep warm. Uncle Yu quickly intervened to smooth things over. Zhang Yi has already done us a big favor. Let's not make things difficult for him, he said diplomatically. Xiao Li Mei started to emotionally manipulate me, saying, Zhang Yi, please think about it for Uncle Yu's sake and for the child. She's so young. Let us stay at your place for a short time. Hearing this, my expression darkened. I knew Xiao Li Mei was a master manipulator, surviving in the previous apocalyptic world by exploiting people's sympathies. But her trick wouldn't work on me. I calmly replied, if this were before the apocalypse, I'd have no problem letting you and your entire village stay. But now, it's the end times. All the tenants in the building want to take over my place. I hope you understand. Xiao Li Mei wasn't giving up. You let Dr. Zhou stay, didn't you? If she can stay, why can't we? She argued. I chuckled at her comparison. Dr. Zhou is my girlfriend. If she doesn't stay at my place, should she stay at yours? Dr. Zhou looked surprised, knowing I was just joking. But having a dependable man to rely on in these times is what every woman desires. Uncle Yu chimed in, yeah, little Zhang has already helped us a lot. Let's not make things more difficult for him. Xiao Li Mei looked dejected, saying, I'm doing all of this for the sake of the child. What will happen to me if something happens to her? Seeing her distress, Uncle Yu felt helpless. He could only leave with her, continually apologizing to me. After they left, I sighed, realizing this woman's meddling might strain my relationship with Uncle Yu. In my opinion, Uncle Yu is the ideal worker. Not only is he honest, but he's also quite skilled. Now, with Xiao Li Mei whispering in his ear, my plans might be delayed. On the other hand, as soon as Uncle Yu got home, he began questioning Xiao Li Mei. Medicine is scarce right now. It's good enough that he gave us some. Why are you so greedy? Xiao Li Mei, holding the child, looked distressed. I'm doing this for our child and our future. I don't plan to freeload off him forever. Hearing this, Uncle Yu sighed. I understand what you mean, but we should be grateful. If it weren't for little Zhang warning me about the snow disaster, I wouldn't be alive today. Upon hearing this, Xiao Li Mei began to ponder. If Zhang Yi knew about the snow disaster in advance, he must have hoarded a lot of supplies. She leaned on Uncle Yu's shoulder. Inside, I understand the principle, but while you see him as a benefactor, he sees you as a potential threat. Didn't you see? He even threw the medicine out to us, afraid that we would enter and take over his home. If he's genuinely a good person, how could he ruthlessly kill dozens of neighbors? In my view, he's just offering minor favors to use you as his henchman later. Before Xiao Li Mei could finish, Uncle Yu loudly interrupted her. Enough. I know you can still distinguish between right and wrong. Please don't speak like this anymore. His angry outburst startled Xiao Li Mei, who then apologized repeatedly. She knew that Uncle Yu was now angry and would have to find another opportunity to stir the pot. Uncle Yu then left, his face stern. Though he is honest and straightforward, he's not foolish. He knows exactly what Xiao Li Mei is thinking. Looking at Tang curled up in sleep, I grimaced. In this apocalyptic world, survival means being ruthless. It's been 75 days of relentless cold, with snow piling up as high as an eight-story building in our residential area. Leaving is nearly impossible. The few of us left can only scavenge for food nearby. Then, unwelcome guests arrived. They dug through the snow and unearthed a tunnel leading to my apartment complex. Some emerged holding shovels and hammers, heading straight for my apartment on the 24th floor. As one tenant tried to escape, they knocked him down without hesitation. Anything alive they find becomes their food. But their main goal is to take over my home. They've discovered I've hoarded a large amount of food. In this desperate time, where food and warmth are scarce, this knowledge is a ticking time bomb. Once they take me down, they can prolong their own survival. Soon enough, this group confidently arrived at my doorstep. A guy skilled in demolition stepped up with a bunch of C4 explosives. After lighting the fuse, he dashed down the corridor. Moments later, there was a huge explosion that jolted me awake. With no time to waste, I grabbed my handgun and checked the surveillance cameras. I saw a bunch of unfamiliar faces sneaking around at the end of the hallway, discussing something with the tools they were holding. I quickly realized they were construction workers from the neighboring building. There were about 20 or more of them, and their bold approach indicated that news of my stash had leaked outside. The group seemed puzzled by the failed explosion. One of them called Old Donkey scratched his head, admitting the explosives might have gotten damp, reducing their power. Another suggested they simply break in, boasting about their skills in tearing down buildings. Watching all this unfold on my monitor, I was furious. 
If the tiger doesn't show its might, they'll think I'm just a harmless cat. I quickly grabbed the white phosphorus I'd stashed away from another dimension. With haste, I whipped up some simple white phosphorus grenades and a few incendiary ones. Tossing them out of a nearby window, I watched as the white phosphorus grenades exploded, instantly heating up to a scorching 1000 degrees Celsius. Two unlucky souls near the door couldn't dodge in time and were melted by the intense heat. The fire spread like wildfire through the corridor. As one of them, Old Donkey, was about to yell to his buddies, a bullet silenced him, piercing through his skull. I grabbed my handgun and fired several shots at the intruders outside. The sight left the team leader, second uncle, frozen in shock. They thought breaching my home would be a piece of cake, but they hadn't counted on my place being a fortress armed with deadly weapons. The last intruder approaching my front door met a similar fate, dropping to the ground lifeless. Second uncle didn't waste a second longer, hastily ushering the remaining crew to retreat back to their neighboring community. They feared sharing the same fate as their fallen comrades, reduced to ashes if they were just a hair too slow. I stared at the handgun, now empty of bullets, lost in thought. In this post-apocalyptic world, there are bound to be stronger interest groups than these workers. Dealing with tough characters like them will require even more powerful weapons. Plus, these guys clearly came prepared. I need to find an opportunity to take them out completely. Returning to the room, I reassured the already terrified Dr. Joe. Don't worry, I've chased those people away. Hearing this, Dr. Joe looked at me with tearful eyes. This was her first encounter with a firefight in this new world. If those people had broken in, she could only imagine the terrible fate awaiting her. But knowing I had driven them away brought her considerable relief. For now, I'm her only support. She asked me what had happened, and I explained briefly. Dr. Joe looked stunned. These people are much more dangerous than Xinjiang Hao. He only had a handgun, but these workers do physical labor every day, making them naturally stronger. And they even know about demolitions. We need to deal with this problem soon, or we won't be able to sleep peacefully in the future. Finishing my thoughts, I glanced at my phone. It's time to find some expendable people to help me out. At the same time, the homeowners group chat was buzzing with activity. I quickly explained the situation to everyone in the group. As soon as they saw my message, they started showering me with praise. Zangi, you're our hero. However, I had to be honest with them, I told them that my weapons were nearly depleted and that everyone would need to fend for themselves. Just then, Uncle Yu called me to check on my situation. He mentioned that he knows the leader of those workers, a man named Huang Tianfan. Under his leadership, dozens of homeowners had already been harmed in the past few days. Hearing this, an idea instantly popped into my mind. Uncle Yu, can you provide me with more details about them? That way, I can discuss plans with everyone to deal with them. Uncle Yu explained that this group comes from the building next door and are part of a gang called the Heavenly United Gang. The gang consists of more than 20 members, with Huang Tianfang as the ruthless leader. His misdeeds are no less than those of Xinjiang Hao. After learning this, I decided to collaborate with the homeowners on the 25th floor to counteract these workers. They've suffered a significant loss at my hands this time, and they'll definitely look for another opportunity to strike back. Unless we eliminate them, nobody will be at peace. The homeowners in my building are the type who only respond to force and wouldn't easily agree to unite against external threats. What I need to do now is wait for the right moment. Turning to Dr. Joe beside me, I expressed my concerns. These neighbors might show respect to me on the surface, but they'd love to tear me down behind my back. So, I'll leave it to you and Uncle you to gather information. The sooner we understand the forces in the area, the better for our next steps. Two and a half days flew by quickly. Dr. Joe, dressed in work attire, listed the latest intelligence on a blackboard. The biggest threat right now is the Heavenly United Gang, composed of labor workers who are naturally stronger than ordinary people. Fortunately, they don't have access to firearms or other deadly weapons. Next up is the Wolf Gang from Building 21, led by thugs Wang Chong and Shaolu. Their members are mostly young people in their 20s. Hearing this, I pondered. It seems the main threats come from these two groups. Homeowners in other buildings have already diminished in numbers through infighting, so they shouldn't pose a threat to me. I instructed Dr. Joe to continue gathering information, emphasizing the importance of confirming whether they possess firearms or other weapons. On the other side, Huang Tianfang led the Heavenly United Gang back again. However, this time they didn't choose to attack my home directly but decided to deal with the surrounding neighbors first. They said that if I don't come out, they'll eliminate all the other homeowners in Building 25. As expected, his words quickly ignited a strong reaction from all the homeowners in the building. Zhang Yi, you're the one who caused all this trouble. Why should we have to bear it? I couldn't help but laugh at the message. These people never change, do they? I replied with a smile, you guys can't resist them, 
so why should I go out and get myself killed? You think you're the only ones with thick skin. What does this have to do with me? This instantly infuriated a few of my neighbors. Zhang Yi, did a dog eat your conscience? Your house is safe as a turtle shell. Have you thought about us? Seeing this, I was immediately enraged. These idiots really don't know the meaning of the word death. What do your lives have to do with me when you all ganged up on me? Where was your talk of conscience then? You don't really think I won't take action against you, do you? Upon reading my message, several neighbors were left speechless because they knew I would really do it. They initially thought they would survive after Xinjiang Hao's death, but now a more ruthless Heavenly United Gang has arrived. If things continue this way, they'll be fertilizer long before the snowstorm ends. Looking at my neighbors who are on the verge of despair, I dialed Uncle Yu with a smile. Uncle Yu, it's your turn to perform. After a long silence, Uncle Yu suddenly spoke in the group chat, Don't be afraid, everyone. The Heavenly United Gang is at most 20 plus people. As long as we work together, we can fend them off. Seeing this message, the homeowner suddenly saw a glimmer of hope. Uncle, you were right. We'll all support you wholeheartedly. However, Uncle then revealed that you haven't eaten for several days. Uncle said that if we want to win this fight, we'd have to rely on me. Not only can my house afford three meals a day, but we also have weapons, making me the most suitable leader for the group. Seeing the message, I couldn't help but smile. I didn't expect Uncle, a seemingly honest man, to be quite skilled at manipulating people. Soon, Uncle, you sent me a private message asking what we should do next. Seeing that the timing was about right, I told Uncle, you, to keep supporting me in the chat. I must seize this opportunity to make everyone listen to me. Only then can our building be safe in the future. Then, I coldly stated in the homeowners group chat, I'm willing to talk more with you all, only because of Uncle, you. I can help, but under one condition, you all have to listen to me, no sneaky moves behind my back. Hearing this, many homeowners quickly responded, as long as you're not sending us to our deaths, we'll do whatever you say, Zangi. Of course, I didn't believe these people would be so cooperative. I immediately replied, I won't send you to your deaths, but I will need you to take up arms against the Heavenly United Gang. Can you do that? The chat went silent. What's the difference between this and sending us to die? Seeing that no one was responding. I chuckled, amused by the suggestion that I should face danger alone. Dr. Joe, standing beside me, seemed equally bewildered by our neighbor's cowardice. In the group chat, I remarked, if that's the case, there's no need for further discussion. You can wait for the Heavenly United Gang to pick you off one by one. My front door is made of steel, so I'm not worried. Uncle Yu quickly chimed in, urging unity, if we continue like this, we're all doomed. Instead of waiting to be slaughtered, why not fight together for survival? His words struck a chord, and the homeowners realized the gravity of our situation. Uncle Yu is right, they agreed. We might as well give it our all. With everyone on board, I laid down the law, from now on, everyone must follow my instructions. If I catch anyone slacking off, don't blame me for being tough. My words sparked a flurry of activity in the group chat, with homeowners calling out those who had been inactive. We were at a critical juncture, and playing dead any longer would only seal our fate. Understanding the need for both kindness and firmness, I reassured the group, since you've chosen to follow me, I won't let you down. Just listen to my orders, and we'll get through this together. I'll head out to find supplies to fortify the building. We need at least some basic combat gear, and luckily, I've already got some snowmobiles prepared. In this snowy apocalypse, I'm the only one who can move around freely in the city. But when the homeowners read my message, they look confused. Won't you freeze to death out there in this extreme cold? They ask. I assure them that I know what I'm doing. As a leader, I have to take action for everyone's sake. I've been managing warehouses for two years, so I know where to find nearby malls and supermarkets. Plus, my own supplies are running low, and we need more to survive. Hearing this, many homeowners are moved to tears, saying I'm the right leader for the job. But only I know the true nature of these people. In the apocalypse, human nature is unpredictable. The neighbors start treating me like a god, saying they'll follow my orders without question. But I don't care about their flattery. If it weren't for fighting against the Heavenly United Gang, I wouldn't care whether they live or die. I can't forget the pain of being torn apart in my previous life. Dr. Joe looks worried. The snowstorm has lasted so long, and the outside world is almost paralyzed. No one knows what dangers lurk out there. I put on my level 3 armor and smile at Dr. Joe. I've been wanting to go out and see for a while now. This is a good opportunity. Don't worry, there are enough supplies at home to sustain you. I still don't fully trust Dr. Joe. She volunteered to go with me, but I playfully pinched her cheek and told her she should stay home and wait for her man. With that, I left, 
assuring her that I trust her completely now. Dr. Joe was touched, but within seconds, I secretly moved all the remaining food and coal into an alternate space. Then, I went downstairs and arrived on the fourth floor. By now, the snow had piled up as high as the third and fourth floors. I only needed to open the window to step directly outside, but as soon as I did, the snow engulfed me up to my knees. Luckily, before the apocalypse, I had stashed some snowmobiles in an alternate space, otherwise, it would have been impossible to move in snow piled meters high. Looking around and seeing no one spying, I took a snowmobile from my alternate space. Unaware that a shadowy figure in the building above was watching my every move, I rode my beloved motorcycle and headed out of the neighborhood. I had been cooped up at home for so long that I was starting to get cabin fever. Finally, I had a chance to breathe some fresh air. After satisfying my urge to speed, I drove the snowmobile to the Heavenly Sea City Police Station. The primary purpose of this trip was to find more powerful weapons. The biggest fear in this post-apocalyptic world is not having enough firepower. As I entered the dark station, it seemed deserted, but I stumbled upon frozen cops who were ill-prepared for the extreme cold. After paying my respects, I found a set of keys under a cloth, keys to all the rooms, including the armory. Excited, I made my way to the armory and found a variety of weapons, including a powerful sniper rifle. With my improved shooting skills, I felt confident in defending my safe house against any threat, even from the Heavenly United Gangs. After securing the weapons, I turned my attention to finding supplies for my neighbors. While my safe house could withstand artillery, it was vulnerable if the load-bearing walls were destroyed. Utilizing my neighbors as a front line of defense seemed like the best strategy. Since the nearby shopping centers were likely depleted, I headed to a large suburban mall buried under snow, relying on memory to navigate. I cleared the snow on the ground with my hand, then broke the skylight and slid down a rope. Seeing all the fancy stuff in the mall, I couldn't help but feel nostalgic. Before the apocalypse, it would take two months' worth of salary just to buy one item. Now, all these luxury goods are just worthless junk. After stashing some useful supplies in my alternate space, I headed to the supermarket on the underground floor. Due to the extreme cold, the fruits were all frozen and spoiled, and some of the meat had turned zombie-like. I managed to find some still edible food and packed it into my bags. I wouldn't normally bother with these items, but they'll do for dealing with the neighbors. Returning to the neighborhood with two large bags of supplies, I caught the attention of a few members of the Heavenly United Gang in the building next door. Huang Tan Fong's eyes lit up at the sight of my snowmobile, with such a vehicle, he could easily go outside to find supplies in the future. The sound of the snowmobile also attracted a crowd of neighbors, though greed was written all over their faces. Uncle, you surprised me, said Little Zhang, seeing me carrying two large bags of supplies. You actually found so much in one go. I sighed. With the snowstorm going on for so long, the local supermarkets have been emptied. Otherwise, I would have brought back even more. Despite the supplies being spoiled by the cold, it was enough to make all the neighbors drool, their eyes filled with anticipation. I quickly grabbed my handgun and warned, I went through a lot to get these. I hope you appreciate it. Hearing this, uncle caught on and shouted, Zhang Yi has brought us hope for survival. Shouldn't we thank him? With the crowd chanting long live Zhang Yi, I knew it was time to make a statement. I had Dr. Joe pour out all the supplies I had found, then looked at everyone and said firmly, since you've all chosen to follow me, I won't let you down. But this is the most dangerous moment, and I, Zhang Yi, won't tolerate idlers. If you eat these supplies, you must pick up arms against the Heavenly United Gang. Just then, members of the Heavenly United Gang arrived at our building, armed and shouting, hand over the food or don't blame us for being rude. Seeing this, I knew the opportunity to test our neighbors had arrived. I pointed at the Heavenly United Gang members outside and said coldly, anyone who can take down one of them will be rewarded with five people's worth of food. Hearing this, the neighbors hesitated for a moment, but seeing only ten members of the Heavenly United Gang outside and considering they were a group of several dozen, they felt emboldened. So, the neighbors, as if injected with courage, armed themselves with pots and pans and charged. Seeing this, the Heavenly United Gang members were stunned. These usually cowardly people were suddenly brave today. Soon, both groups were fiercely fighting in the snow for the sake of food. Everyone was seeing red, and even though they got injured multiple times, they felt no pain. This was exactly what I wanted to see. I'm no saint, but if these neighbors are willing to fight for their lives, I certainly won't hesitate to provide them with food. At that moment, Uncle Yu shouted, Everyone, let's go. They are outnumbered and won't hold on for long. With Uncle Yu, a retired soldier, joining the fray, the battle quickly turned one-sided. Seeing they were no match, the remaining Heavenly United gang members fled towards their building without looking back. Witnessing this, all the neighbors picked up their weapons and cheered. It was their first victory, 
fought for their own survival. However, despite our win, many people were severely injured, and without professional equipment and medication, they likely won't survive for long. Moments later, I gathered all the neighbors in the building's lobby. You all did very well, I praised them. As you've seen, this is the power of unity. As long as we work together, even the apocalypse may not be insurmountable. I then turned to the two young individuals who performed the best in the battle. You both did extremely well. Keep up this momentum moving forward. I handed them two portions of food, and seeing this, they were so moved that they burst into tears, finally able to eat a full meal in this apocalyptic world. The rest of the neighbors were filled with regret, wishing they had given it their all. This was exactly the kind of attitude I wanted to see, so that everyone would fight against external enemies without holding back. I waved my hand, calling each person forward to receive their daily food ration. As the remaining neighbors approached, some who received less food looked regretful, wishing they had contributed more earlier. When it was Su Hao's turn, a wealthy second-generation individual, I tossed him a small piece of candy. Seeing that others had at least a biscuit while he only had candy, he immediately protested, claiming it wasn't fair. I responded coldly, reminding him that while others were fighting on the front lines, he was merely shouting slogans from the back. Giving him candy was already generous, considering his lack of contribution. This seemed to reassure the neighbors who received less food, knowing they weren't at the bottom. However, Su Hao continued to argue, claiming there were too many people fighting for him to find a way in. I simply laughed, stating that I only care about results, not excuses. His protests only fueled his anger, accusing me of unfairness and targeting him. Without hesitation, I signaled for two neighbors to restrain him. I questioned his audacity to talk about fairness with me, especially when a woman in her forties from next door managed to find a way in and throw a few punches. After silencing Su Hao, I pointed a gun at him, asking the group what should be done with someone so undisciplined and disobedient. In response, the two neighbors holding Su Hao began to beat him. I turned to my neighbors and said, if anyone thinks I'm being too much, feel free to find your own food. I, Zhang Yi, won't bother you. Seeing no objections, I clapped my hands and said, very good. I hope everyone will follow the arrangements from now on. But Su Hao, used to being arrogant, wasn't convinced. Zhang Yi, don't push people too far, he said. Before he could finish, I stepped on his hand. Su Hao, we're in a post-apocalyptic world now. You can't go back to your cushy life. I won't support a waste like you who only knows how to eat. I warned everyone to take it seriously and asked Dr. Zhou to collect the remaining food for distribution later. But then, Fa Yu Ching's voice broke through the crowd. Brother Zhang Yi, I haven't received any food yet, she said, pushing her way forward with her best friend. She claimed I treated her the best and hadn't forgotten about her. I couldn't help but laugh. Of course, I haven't forgotten about you, because there was never any food allocated for you in the first place. Hearing this, Fa Yu Ching burst into tears, but I pushed her away gently, saying it was just casual talk. I told her I already had a girlfriend, Dr. Joe, and asked her to stop bothering me. Dr. Joe came over and acted affectionately with me, putting an end to the situation. Seeing Fa Yu Ching cry even harder, I couldn't help but laugh. You used to think your looks could attract anyone, but now, in this post-apocalyptic world, how many packs of instant noodles do you think your face is worth? Su Ao, lying on the ground, chimed in, calling her out as a schemer from before the apocalypse. The neighbors around us started gossiping, shocked to realize the seemingly innocent white lotus was actually quite manipulative. Trying to regain control of the situation, Fa Yu Ching attempted to silence everyone, but her efforts fell on deaf ears. Left with no other option, she yelled and ran away. I decided to reward Suha, who had shown sensibility, with another candy. After that, I got to work arranging the defense of the building. Excluding the children who couldn't fight, we still had 47 people in building 25. I divided them into six small groups, each consisting of seven to eight people, to take turns guarding against attacks from other buildings on eight-hour shifts. We established a signal in case of emergencies, everyone would hit the stair railing or other metal objects to alert everyone else. The same incentives for killing enemies remained in place, whoever kills an outsider gets enough food for five people. Of course, those who slack off during their shifts will only get leftover food. After saying this, I patted Uncle Yu on the shoulder. As a military veteran, he's the best person to handle it all. Two days flew by, and the Heavenly United Gang didn't seem eager to attack. Dr. Joe looked worried, sensing trouble in the peace. Meanwhile, I was on my tablet, learning about different ways to use firearms. The heavy snow had trapped the city, covering the lower buildings. Even if the snow stopped, it'd take two and a half months to melt. In this post-apocalyptic world, human hearts are scarier than natural disasters. 
I then took out the firearms I'd obtained from the armory through the pocket dimension. With enough firepower, I'm not afraid of any number of enemies. The sniper rifle even had an 8 power scope for observing the community. I took it to the balcony to practice my rusty shooting skills when two figures appeared in my scope. A cold smile spread across my lips. Finally, the Heavenly United Gang couldn't resist, heading towards the community garage. I quickly realized they were probably after my snowmobile. Unfortunately for them, their efforts were bound to fail. During the day, I pretended to leave the snowmobile in the garage, but I had already stashed it in the pocket dimension. Just then, Uncle Yu called to inform me that the defense personnel had been properly arranged. He advised me not to take to heart what Xiao Li Mei had said during the day, noting she's a bit talkative. I chuckled at that, I wouldn't hold a grudge against a woman for such things. But then I teased Uncle Yu, asking if he was sure about raising a child for someone else. I really didn't like Xiao Li Mei, but I didn't want to ruin my relationship with Uncle Yu either. He just laughed heartily, saying finding a woman in these times was already a good thing, one couldn't ask for too much. I playfully suggested that with his health and strength, he could have plenty of women interested in him, even suggesting Sally May could have a child for him. Uncle Yu looked awkward at my words, knowing men usually cared about their own bloodline. But that was something to think about in the future, after all, it's the end of the world, and we can hardly find enough to eat, let alone have time for children. As for other people's family matters, it wasn't my place to comment, especially when I had my own problems to deal with. Meanwhile, a group from the Heavenly United Gang stealthily entered the first floor lobby under the cover of darkness. This time, Wan Tanfang's nephew, Huang Wei, led the group, bringing eight people with him. As they reached the stairs, a brick came flying towards him. Luckily, he reacted fast and dodged it. But then, a series of knocks echoed through the stairwell, enemy attack. Enemy attack. Those jerks from the Heavenly United Gang were back. Hearing this, Wang Wei was furious. Brothers, charge with me. Let's take down these cowards, he exclaimed, leading the charge towards the stairwell. Little did he know, my reward policy had the neighbors on duty pumped up like they'd been injected with adrenaline. In no time, they had already taken down several members of the Heavenly United Gang. Seeing how fierce they were, Huang Wei quickly ordered the rest of his people to retreat. Watching the gang members scatter, the neighbors decided not to pursue them. The snowstorm outside made it too risky, and they didn't want to be ambushed. The knocking sounds in the stairwell woke me up from my sleep. These guys sure know how to pick their moments. Suddenly, a thought popped into my head, I finally have a chance to practice my shooting skills. They say a gun is fast within a hundred steps. I grabbed my trusty sniper rifle from my pocket. Not today, fellas, I muttered to myself as I set up the rifle and aimed at one of the fleeing gang members. Thanks to the 8x scope, I could even see the hairs in the guy's nostrils. As I pulled the trigger with my index finger, a loud gunshot broke the silence of the night, and the bullet struck the escaping thug dead on. I couldn't help but feel a rush of satisfaction. Could I really be a natural-born marksman? The remaining members of the Heavenly United Gang looked horrified as they saw their companion fall to the ground in a pool of blood. Panic set in, and they sprinted back towards their own compound as if their lives depended on it. Watching them flee, I couldn't help but grin. I quickly set up the sniper rifle again, but then something strange happened. It felt like time slowed down as I looked through the scope. Without hesitation, I took another shot, hitting another goon in the head as he fled. It dawned on me that my awakened abilities might extend beyond the pocket dimension. Could I also have the talent of a marksman? To test this theory, I fired five consecutive shots, each one hitting its target with deadly accuracy. A smile crept onto my face. With this marksman's talent, all I'd need in the future is to find a good sniping spot to deal with intruders. My exceptional marksmanship also surprised everyone in the building, putting an end to any petty ideas the neighbors might have had. The next morning, Dr. Joe prepared me a bowl of noodles. With a nervous expression, she asked if I had fired the gun last night. I smiled in response. The reckless Heavenly United gang had attempted another sneak attack, so I had to take action. Hearing this, Dr. Joe looked at me with admiration. She had initially sought my protection for survival, but now she seemed captivated by my charm. Outwardly, I remained calm, but inside, I felt thrilled. How had I gone from being a nobody in my past life to being seen as a godlike figure by beautiful women? It was a complete turnaround. Meanwhile, the members of the Heavenly United Gang stood silently as they looked at the bodies in the snow. Their repeated attempts to raid us had failed, resulting in the loss of their own men, including Huang Tianfang's nephew. Initially, they had relied on brute force to intimidate others, but now they realized the power I wielded. They had nothing to counter it. Moreover, facing food scarcity, they knew they would soon starve if they couldn't obtain any provisions. In response to their situation, 
Wang Tianfan made a tough decision. He ordered his men to retrieve the bodies of Huang Wei and the others, hoping to prolong their survival by any means necessary. Meanwhile, I continued my usual duty of patrolling the building and checking on the neighbors. After the events of last night, their attitude towards me had transformed into genuine awe. They understood that under my leadership, our chances of survival were greatly improved. In this post-apocalyptic world, I recently rode my beloved snowmobile and left the community. Uncle had provided me with the location of a nearby army camp after I asked him to take good care of the people in the base. Heading towards the army camp's location, this scene was witnessed by Wolfgang from Building 21. They were puzzled about where I had hidden the snowmobile because they had previously searched the entire underground garage but found nothing. If they had a snowmobile, they could freely go on shopping sprees in various malls, gather more supplies, expand their territory, and recruit more people, becoming local warlords in this apocalyptic world. On the side, Shaolu nodded in agreement. In troubled times, heroes emerge. Now is the perfect time for us brothers to take the throne. Thinking of this, Wang Chun's eyes were bloodshot. We must get our hands on that snowmobile. Meanwhile, I rode my snowmobile, galloping through the snow. Before going to the army camp, I decided to first scavenge materials around the city. Heavy snow had been falling for three months now, and some small shops were already buried. To get supplies, I could only look for a few independent large supermarkets in the city. Then, I remembered the Walmart South warehouse where I used to work. Though the largest warehouse had been emptied by me before the apocalypse, there were still several smaller ones nearby which were sure to have useful supplies. I drove to Walmart South warehouse, where products from various groups in Heavenly Sea City were stocked. If I could bring all these supplies back, they'd be enough for thousands of people. But when I broke the skylight, I found most of the supplies were already gone before the snow disaster. Still, I climbed down to check for anything left. Luckily, I found several heavy-duty trucks and some luxury sports cars, though they seemed useless for now. Who knows, they might come in handy later for showing off. After scavenging some useful supplies from other warehouses, I headed to the gas station. I definitely needed fuel for the snowmobile, my main mode of transportation. To my surprise, the gas station was buried under snow, with only a signpost visible. This was a problem. If only I had an excavator. Wait, didn't I put a few excavators into my alternate space earlier? I immediately retrieved one. Since the snow hadn't frozen solid yet, digging out the gas station would be easy. Fortunately, I had experience driving forklifts in the warehouse, so operating the excavator wasn't an issue. I started digging towards the gas station without hesitation. After digging for two hours, I heard a clear metallic clang from the shovel, and the gas station's large roof platform gradually began to appear. Next, I went inside the gas station to find the fuel storage. Usually, fuel storage for gas stations is underground. I found the basement door and pried it open with a crowbar. Before entering, I quickly removed any static electricity from my body to prevent accidents. Soon, several large fuel tanks appeared before me. With these fuel reserves, I could travel through the snow again in the future. I then dismantled the hose on top of the fuel tanks and used plastic wrap to seal the openings to prevent gasoline leakage. Just as I was about to put the entire fuel tank into my alternate space, I suddenly realized something very important. Under these layers of snow, almost everyone was practically immobile, but not me. In addition to freely traversing the snowy landscape, I also had several excavators with me. That meant all the resources buried under the heavy snow were essentially at my disposal. After storing the gas station's fuel into my alternate space, it was already 8 o'clock in the evening. So, I decided to rest here for the night and visit the army camp that uncle had mentioned during the day. Meanwhile back in the residential area a Xiao Li Mei's child had a high fever. When the temperature reached 40 degrees Celsius, Xiao Li Mei felt helpless because her medicine box was empty of emergency medications. Then, Uncle Yu arrived with a box of children's fever medicine that Zhang Yi had provided before. There was a little left, so we used it for the child. He patted the shoulder of the neighbor and reassured her, saying, Don't worry. When Zhang Yi comes back this time, I'm sure life will get better for everyone. With Uncle Yu's fever medicine, the child's high fever finally subsided. However, Dr. Zhou reminded the mother to keep a close eye on her baby's condition, especially since infants are highly susceptible to illness in extreme cold weather. After giving her advice, Dr. Zhou and Uncle Yu began their routine patrol. They had barely taken a few steps when they heard a woman scream from behind them. Auntie Lin from the neighborhood committee was seen lunging at the child in the mother's arms with a small knife, shouting, My grandson is dead. Your children shouldn't be allowed to live either. Out of maternal instinct, the mother immediately turned to block the knife. Seeing this, Dr. Joe quickly caught the baby, who had slipped from the mother's arms. The mother, entrusting her child to Dr. Joe, collapsed in a pool of blood. 
At that moment, Annie Lynn pointed at Dr. Joe and shouted, blaming her and everyone else for the death of her child. It was clear she was completely distraught. Dr. Joe realized there was no reasoning with her, so she swiftly made her way toward the stairwell, clutching the child tightly. But Annie Lynn grabbed her ankle, brandishing a knife, accusing Dr. Joe of deserving death for not saving her child. Just as Annie Lynn was about to strike, Uncle intervened, kicking her to the ground. He got nicked by the knife, but seeing Dr. Joe unharmed, he felt relieved. Auntie Lynn continued her tirade, blaming others and even biting people nearby. Uncle became furious, defending Zhang Yi for his actions. Dr. Joe stepped forward, explaining that Zhang Yi did try to help by sending medicine, but it was too late. Your precious grandson had already been turned into a pot of rice porridge by you upon hearing these words Annie Lin fell into another frenzy shouting it's impossible it was unbelievable. Two neighbors stepped up to mock Annie Lin. It's like we finally understand the true meaning of loving someone too much, even to the point of harming them. She always boasted about adoring her grandson, but this was the ugly truth of her love. Despite her countless wrongdoings, they dared to show such cruelty. One of them even flicked on a lighter, offering a bit of warmth to Annie Lin before her demise. Meanwhile, as I stepped out of the tent, it was time to make my way to the army camp. Following the directions of the retired soldier uncle, I hopped onto my snowmobile and zoomed off to the nearby military base. With the experience from digging out the gas station last time, I smoothly got to work. Before long, I had uncovered the entrance to the camp's dormitories. What puzzled me was the eerie emptiness of the camp. Considering the sudden snow disaster and the remote location, plus the lack of transportation, it didn't make sense for the military to evacuate so quickly. A chilling thought crossed my mind, did they know about the disaster beforehand and evacuate in advance? If that were true, whoever had those supplies and weapons after the disaster could establish dominance in this new world order. It painted a grim picture of various factions fighting for control in a post-apocalyptic battleground. I figure I better gear up for what's coming in this new era. With that in mind, I keep working the excavator, digging away with gusto. Suddenly, there's this huge noise as I create a massive hole in the wall of the weapons arsenal. But when I peek inside, I'm stunned. There's a dazzling array of military supplies in there. I expected to find just a few odds and ends, but it turns out to be a jackpot. Sure, there are no tanks or heavy armored vehicles, but I figure the military must have taken those out on a mission. No biggie, I've got plenty for now. If I need more firepower later, I can always scavenge at another camp. After stashing all the supplies in my pocket dimension, I hop on my snowmobile and head home. But when I get back, the neighbors notice I'm empty-handed and start accusing me. Zhang Yi, you've been gone for two days and couldn't find any food? Did you keep it all for yourself? They say. I can't help but laugh at their audacity. Seriously? Just two days and you're already acting like this? Don't forget who saved you ungrateful folks in the first place. From now on, we're each on our own. You can find your own food. One of the neighbors steps forward to try and smooth things over, but I'm not buying it. It's tough finding food in the snow. I suggest heading back to rest for now. Inside building 25, resentment filled the air when everyone learned I hadn't brought back any food. They felt they'd already done enough defending the building for me, and my lack of gratitude didn't sit well with them. A person in a red hat stepped forward, seemingly sincere, suggesting I bring others with me next time to search for food, emphasizing the strength in numbers. But I sensed something off about him, especially with the small knife hidden behind his back. Two other neighbors stepped forward to support him, offering their help but I knew their intentions weren't pure. Without hesitation, I pulled out a gun from my pocket and shot the guy in the red hat in the head. I wasn't fooled by their fake kindness. I've been too lenient with them, and they've forgotten how to survive without me. They would have been food for chinching how long ago if it weren't for me. The gang heard this, and a few neighbors quickly tried to explain themselves. Zhang Yi, don't go too far. We just wanted to talk, they said, but before they could finish, I fired off several more shots in an instant. The two leading the conversation were taken care of, and seeing this, the rest scattered in all directions, fleeing for their lives. The gunshots quickly caught the attention of Uncle Yu and two others, and Dr. Joe rushed over, her face filled with concern, asking if I was hurt. I reassured her, squeezing her hand, those guys couldn't hurt me. Uncle Yu, upon learning the reason, was furious. These fools deserve to pay. A few free meals and they forget who they depend on, he said angrily. I just smiled. I've always been kind. I couldn't be bothered to chase after those who fled. Hearing this, Xiao Li Mei felt a shiver down her spine, knowing I did it as a warning to others. Then, I started planning for the future. Relying solely on these expendables wouldn't keep the building secure forever. Back at the safe house, I asked Dr. Zhou if anything had happened during the two days I was away. 
she reported that Annie Lynn had gone mad after her grandson's death and had killed a neighbor who lived upstairs. However, she was taken care of by two other neighbors. Additionally, someone from Building 9 named Chen Lingyu wanted to discuss something with me. However, the details of the cooperation would need to be handled by me personally. I wasn't impressed. I had supplies and weapons, so what could this woman offer to make me want to cooperate with her? I decided to ask Dr. Zhou about her identity. From her, I learned that Xin Lingyu used to own a cosmetics company in Heavenly Sea City before the apocalypse. Now, with her strong methods, she's completely taken control of Building 9. I was surprised to hear this. Xin Lingyu must have some real skills to manage an entire building. Dr. Zhou noticed my interest and suggested I at least find out what Xin Lingyu wants to cooperate on. She was curious about how a woman managed to get an entire building to fall in line. Just then, I received two friend requests on my phone. Along with Chen Ling, there was also one from my company's previous financial director, Li Jin. I wondered what this guy wanted. As soon as I accepted the friend requests, Chen Ling messaged me right away, asking if we could chat. I got straight to the point, telling her to say what she had to say. She replied that typing was inconvenient for her and wanted to have a voice chat instead. I promptly refused. Seeing this, she didn't take it lightly. Initially, she wanted to use her pre-apocalypse persuasion techniques to win me over, but I didn't give her the chance. Plus, since we live in the same complex, she knows what I'm capable of and had to resort to texting. She wrote, Mr. Zhang, I've heard about your reputation. I know you have a snowmobile and can scavenge for supplies. So, I propose we work together to gather resources. I couldn't help but grin. If we team up, what's in it for me? I asked. She replied that her building had many survivors and could provide manpower to help expand territories. But the catch was, I had to provide food for them first. Before I could respond, she added, Mr. Zhang, you're a target for everyone. Building 25 has already been attacked, and the masses are weighing their options. But if you provide us with food, you'll be safe from our Building 9, I chuckled. Are you threatening me? I asked. She smirked and said, cooperating with us would be beneficial for both of us. I couldn't help but find her boldness amusing. Let me think about it for a few days, I said with a smile. I gaze out the window, lost in thought. Would the whole community turn against me? I'm not afraid to face them one by one, but if they unite, like Chin Ling suggested, they could easily tear down the entire building. Even though we lack the electricity and machinery outside for such destruction, things could get messy if experts and explosives are brought in. Just as I'm pondering my next move, a new message pops up on my phone. It's from my former colleague, Li Jin, who goes on and on about cooperating to build a harmonious post-apocalyptic utopia. He mentions the good vibes in Building 18 but points out the lack of food resources. I smile at the smooth talk, intellectuals really know how to butter you up. Curious about the situation in Building 18, I ask Dr. Zhou for her input. She confirms Li Jin's capabilities, praising his ability to unite the residents and distribute resources fairly, which helped most of them survive after the apocalypse. I chuckled, realizing that their unity was just a facade, based solely on the fact that they still had food. Once that ran out, who knew what would happen? Glancing at the friend requests from building owners on my phone, all seeking cooperation, I knew I had two choices, go to war or cooperate. Turning to Dr. Zhou, I asked if there was a way to have the best of both worlds. She suggested leaving the community and starting fresh elsewhere, leaving me speechless. It seemed like an impossible task, unless we became hermits in some remote place with no people. The next morning, I had Dr. Joe dismantle the bulletproof vest to fashion makeshift bulletproof pants. After a night of contemplation, I knew what to do next. I tagged everyone in the community group chat, informing them of the crisis facing Building 25. Nearby buildings were jealous that I could find food and were threatening to attack unless I handed over the food and snowmobile. The chat exploded with outrage, how could they expect us to give up our only means of survival? I reassured everyone that we had to defend our food supply at all costs. Despite feeling relieved, I couldn't shake the worry that they might turn on me later. Just then, I received a message on my phone from Chin Ling, adding me to a discussion group for community building owners. It seems like they're gearing up to confront me. Wang Chong from Building 21 jumped in sarcastically, saying, Zhang Yi, I've heard you've been living the good life lately, always having food to eat. You're comfortable, but you're not thinking about us, you're poor neighbors. Huang Tan Fong from Building 26 also made a direct threat, warning that if I abandon the negotiations now, they couldn't guarantee what would happen. Only Lycan from Building 18 acted as a mediator. Then Li Jin laid out the conditions for negotiation. First, I must provide supplies to ensure basic survival. Second, my snowmobile must become communal, allowing everyone to take turns using it. Finally, 
I must share all known resource locations with everyone. If I didn't accept, I'd become the enemy of the entire community. Seeing this, I chuckled. These guys could just rob me, but they're pretending it's negotiation. Looks like I need a strategic opportunity to deal with all of them at once. But they're thousands in number, so it would be quite difficult to act. Just then, an idea occurred to me. Handling thousands of people might be tough, but dealing with a few building owners should be much more manageable. So, I pretended to discuss negotiation locations with them and began to arm myself. They have no accurate assessment of my firepower. Once they arrive at the agreed location, a single grenade from me will either kill or severely injure them. Then, the thousands of residents will be like a dragon without a head, easily defeated. Meanwhile, in the hallway, Uncle Yu was distributing food to neighbors to replenish their strength. Because the negotiation time was approaching, everyone needed to be well fed to defend building 25 neighbors. People who hadn't eaten in days were deeply moved to tears when they saw me. My presence caused quite a stir among everyone. I reassured them that if the negotiation went well, we could finally return to normal life without any more bloodshed. Everyone needed to be at their best today, defending their positions. Hearing this, tears welled up in everyone's eyes, and they pledged their loyalty to me even in the next life. Leading everyone to the agreed negotiation spot, I mingled among the crowd, ready to strike when the time was right. As parties from different buildings gathered in the community square, I was surprised by the opposing side's overwhelming numbers. It seemed like they were trying to pressure us. Immediately, I called Uncle Yu and asked him to meet them with a team while I stayed back to provide firepower. Setting up a sniper rifle, I took on the role of a sniper. As Uncle Yu and the others were surrounded by people from various sides, I could see the tension rising. Uncle Yu realized that they weren't here to negotiate but to eliminate us. A nervous neighbor voiced concern about the outnumbered situation, but Uncle Yu assured him that their main goal was to pressure me into negotiating. We don't have anything they want. The building owner smirked at the front of the crowd, thinking the negotiation was in the bag. Chen Ling seemed pleased too. Zhang Yi might be intimidating alone, but with thousands of us, what's there to fear? On our way to the negotiation, these building owners had already agreed not to give me a chance to isolate any of them. At this point, Wang Chong chuckled, saying, See? We can scare Zhang Yi just with our sheer numbers. He's probably gone back to change his diapers by now. Chin Ling grew impatient, saying, Enough with the nonsense. Let's get Zhang Yi out here to negotiate. Once he accepts the predetermined conditions, it's over. Hearing this, Wang Tian Fong stepped forward and shouted, Where's Zhang Yi? Get him out here to negotiate now. If he makes us wait any longer, he's going to regret it. Uncle Yu looked at the group and said, Our boss is waiting for you upstairs. Weren't all the building owners supposed to come for the negotiation? Li Jen adjusted his glasses. We've discussed it. The five of us building owners will represent everyone. Hearing this, Uncle Yu didn't say much more. Fine, but only the five of you building owners are allowed in, and you must also consent to a search. Chin Ling and Wang Chan burst into laughter. What does Zhang Yi think he is, making conditions at this time? Do you believe we can wipe all of you out right now? Seeing them act so arrogantly, how could I tolerate it? I immediately called Uncle Yu and told him to have everyone retreat 20 meters. Although he didn't know what I was planning Uncle Yu complied as I directed, allowing everyone to move back. Seeing this, Wang Chong threatened us, warning against any tricks. Despite being separated by more than 20 meters, Wang Chong and his group felt confident in their overwhelming numbers. However, the unexpected occurred when I blew a whistle from behind Uncle Yu. I tossed a hand grenade toward Wang Chong and his crew, causing chaos as it exploded in their midst. When the smoke cleared, a large hole remained, along with several bodies. As Uncle Yu approached with a phone emitting my voice, I taunted Wang Chong's group, revealing that I had more grenades at my disposal. This revelation left everyone frozen in shock, unable to comprehend where I obtained such weaponry. Wang Chong attempted to negotiate through the phone, but I mocked their insincerity in bringing over a thousand people for negotiations. With less than five minutes remaining, Zhang Yi issued an ultimatum, meet us or face the consequences. Panicked, everyone realized they wouldn't stand a chance in a fight and hastily fled the scene. From the 13th floor, I watched the dispersing crowd below, satisfied with the outcome. Well, I've only got 20 boxes of grenades left, so I better save them for later. I waited leisurely for Wang Chong, Huang Tianfang, and the others to arrive. A few minutes later, several people ran up, panting heavily. I looked at the people in front of me somewhat disappointed. I had initially wanted to gather all the building owners together for a comprehensive sweep, but now I had only five representatives. I'd have to implement my second plan. After everyone was seated, Li Qin brought up the previously discussed proposal, asking me to provide materials for their labor force while they provided the labor. 
otherwise, all the workers would unite to attack my apartment building. Uninterested in further discussion, I simply pulled out a handgun and slapped it on the table with a loud bang. All five faces changed color, and they subconsciously thought of running away. Wang Chong stuttered, Zhang Yi, what do you mean by this? Even if you kill us, the whole community will not let you go. I smiled faintly. Why are you guys so nervous? I just felt that this handgun was in the way, so I took it out to let it air. Everyone relax, let's sit down and continue the talk. First of all, your demand is something I can't agree to. Taking responsibility for the supplies of the entire community is an impossible task for anyone. Most importantly, if you've been able to control the residents of a building in these hard times, you're clearly smart people. As far as I know, you're not so charitable as to go hungry yourselves while caring about your neighbors, are you? With that, I slapped the table. Here are my terms for cooperation. If you don't accept them, then we go to war. He raised an eyebrow and continued, I can provide food, but here's the catch, only enough for 10 people per building. Who gets this food and how it's divided is up to you and should be settled within your own building. Zhang Yi made a helpless gesture. Supplying food for around 300 people daily is already the maximum I can manage. As soon as he finished speaking, Qin Ling looked furious. Unacceptable. Are you treating us like beggars? Ten portions of supplies are too few. I have 76 survivors alone, and among my company employees, there are over 20. How are we supposed to divide that? Seeing this, I slammed my gun on the table. It seems there's no room for negotiation. Then let the war begin. Upon hearing this, Wang Tan Fong quickly stepped forward. Don't listen to this woman's nonsense. She doesn't represent all of us. However, providing for only 10 people per building really isn't enough to go around. Wang Kan on the side also agreed. This amount of supplies is not enough. To explain to other building owners, can we add a little more? But I just loaded my gun. Do you really think I'm a saint? Providing food for 300 people daily, and you still complain? Seeing this, Li Chan quickly approached and said, Zhang Yi, don't be impulsive. Let's think about it. I casually propped my foot up on the table, ready to discuss the real deal. All right, let's talk about what we need to do for sustainable development. Just scavenging for supplies won't cut it forever. Who knows how long this snowfall will last. I tossed a bag of seeds onto the table. These are seeds I found outside. I reckon we should start planting crops. That's the only way we'll have a steady food supply. Chin Ling and the gang looked at me like I'd lost my marbles. Are you crazy, Zhang Yi? It's minus 80 degrees out there, and the snow's meters thick. How can anything grow in that? I just grinned. Can't you dig through the frost? There's plenty of land outside. We gotta start farming if we wanna develop sustainably. Who knows how long this snow's gonna stick around. Even if I gave you a thousand snowmobiles, our outside supplies would eventually dry up. So why not start now and learn from our ancestors, eh? Get our hands dirty to put food on the table. At the mention of tangible progress in farming, Wang Chong and Huang Tian Fong perked up. Brother Zhang, can you get us cigarettes too? They were both heavy smokers, and they hadn't had a puff since the snow disaster hit. I pulled out a fresh pack from my pocket, offering it to them. Their faces lit up with pure joy as they eagerly took a smoke. They were willing to agree to anything as long as they got their daily fix. Seeing their excitement, Legion wanted to steer the conversation back to the main issue, but I cut him off. No worries, I can hook you both up with a pack every day. I happily came to an agreement with Wang Chong and Huang Tianfan. Seeing them easily swayed, Li Yin and his crew couldn't hide their frustration. They were about to mess everything up. Li Yin tried to negotiate for more, but Wang Chong shut him down before he could even start. There's nothing to negotiate. Sean's offer is already generous. Let's go along with it, Wang Tianfang added. This left Li Yin speechless. Sometimes, it's not the formidable opponents you should worry about, but the stubborn teammates. Just then, the building owner, Zhang Yunyan, spoke up, reminding us that the decision wasn't solely ours. We needed to consult the other building owners who weren't present. Wang Chong and Huang Tianfan once again proved their incompetence, questioning the decision we had already made. Ignoring their bickering, I glanced out the window and spotted a group gathering at the entrance of Building 25, where I was. I immediately drew my pistol and shouted, demanding to know why they were there. Did Wang Chong arrange for them to ambush us during the negotiation? Wang Chong quickly raised his hands in surrender, insisting that all the building owners were present. Who would dare to ambush us with everyone here? started organizing an attack on their own. Seeing this, I pointed my gun at them threateningly, commanding them to sit down and stay still. Just then, Uncle Yu arrived with a group of men in the negotiation room. Following my instructions, they temporarily restrained the five of them. 
I then went to the balcony with my heavy gun, thinking what fools they were for not valuing their lives. Without another word, I took aim at the man leading the charge. Being a sniper, I took two out with a single shot, instantly blasting the heads of two lackeys. Seeing this, the group panicked and became disarrayed. Zangi has a sniper rifle. Everyone, take cover, they shouted in fear. I couldn't help but smile at their fear, it only made me more excited. Then, I fired several more shots, taking out a few more lackeys. The five in the negotiation room dared not even breathe. After wiping the smoking barrel of my gun, I turned to them and asked, do any of you have any objections now? Hearing this, Wang Chung and Wan Tin Fong were the first to raise their hands, signaling they had no objections. Xinling, Yu, and Zhang Yi Union followed suit, agreeing to my terms. Seeing this, Li Jian couldn't say much and reluctantly raised his hand in agreement. I smiled and said, good. If everyone had been this reasonable from the start, it would have been better, right? Why force me to act? Peace is more profitable. With that, I patted Jin on the shoulder. Go back and do as I told you, no tricks. With the negotiations concluded amicably, Li Jian and the others left Building 25. As my neighbors expressed concern for my well-being, I greeted them with a smile and reassured them that everything was sorted out. Their praise followed, but I couldn't help but think they deserved a wake-up call to recognize my capabilities. I then went on to explain the negotiation details, which left them uneasy at the thought of providing so much food. With a calm demeanor, I reminded them of the daunting odds we faced if we didn't comply. Despite their worries, I assured them that as long as I, Zhang Yi, was alive, no one would go hungry. Moved by my words, they tearfully pledged their loyalty. However, Uncle Yu seemed puzzled, questioning the practicality of playing the hero in a post-apocalyptic world. I assured him it was only a temporary arrangement. Later, I confided in Uncle Yu about my original plan, to lure their leaders and eliminate them, weakening their forces. However, their decision to send only five representatives forced us to adjust our strategy and play the long game. Now, as I promised to provide food for 300 of their people daily, it's inevitable that this will lead to unequal food distribution among them. Once internal conflicts arise, they'll turn on each other. At that point, we can simply sit back and reap the benefits. Hearing this, Uncle had a moment of realization. It's always you, Zhang Yi, thinking steps ahead. If it were me, I would have probably gone head to head with them already. I gazed out of the window at the fallen bodies inside. Right now, I'm just using the ample resources in my hands to wear down these adversaries. We don't know what the outside world is like now, but there will certainly be other, more threatening groups. If we want to truly establish ourselves in this post-apocalyptic world, we need ample firepower and a strong fortress. Hearing this, Uncle seemed deep in thought. You're right, Zhang Yi. It's only the beginning of the end. Who knows what challenges lie ahead. With this, the chapter concludes. Don't miss out on the next installment. Hit that subscribe button.